picture this. You are playing a chess tournament in less than a month, and you're wondering, how can I best prepare for the tournament? It's not going to be so easy to massively improve your chess game in just one month, right? So the question then becomes, how can we make the most of our current ability to have the best performance possible? Hey, I'm Grandmaster Max Sillingworth, and in this training video, I'm going to share with you how to prepare an opening repertoire for a tournament. Of course, you definitely should be also doing the other things like, you know, just playing some games in the time control that you're going to be playing for that tournament. We like to, to call them training games here among us professional players. Uh, we also want to be doing our tactics puzzles each day to make sure that we are mentally sharp for the, the tournament. But in this video, I'm going to focus on the opening preparation aspect and talk about how to pick your openings for a tournament, as it were. Um, if you're wondering how to get into this lead chess study, I'll just show you that just really quickly. Just go learn. You can do this from the home page. Just click learn study. And then when you do that, you just click on the plus icon in the top right. And that's going to create a, a new study for you. By the way, when you are creating the study, just make sure that you have the visibility set to invite only. Because otherwise other people might see your preparation and, well, you probably don't want that, right? If you're enjoying the video, do make sure to leave a, a like and a subscribe. So for the chapters, I'm just going to mark these as our white opening repertoire and the other one as our black opening repertoire. If you're wondering how I got it from black's point of view, you just go orientation black and that's going to allow you to see it from black's perspective. So, okay, we've got our white opening and black opening repertoire games. And if you're wondering what a repertoire is, it's basically just a set of opening moves that we play against the most common replies of our opponents as such. Um, let's start with the white opening repertoire. That one's going to be kind of the easier one to, to begin with. Uh, so for this situation, I'm going to use the hypothetical of that we're playing a tournament, like an under 1600 tournament where all of the players are rated below. 1600 over the board rating which if we go to the lead chess explorer which is the book or icon uh right next to the bottom right hand corner of the board it's going to bring up some cool features where uh let's just say i change the settings so you can see the games of all levels here you can see that we're looking at a database of nearly 5 billion games and this database of 5 billion games is going to give us a really large amount of data for determining, well, what's going to score the best and be the most effective against the opponents that we're likely to face in our games. By the way, this is also the philosophy I'll share with you here is also the one that I do use in my chess pool courses as well, I are aimed at the certain rating levels, let's say. So for this one, because we're using a hypothetical of, below, of players all below 1600 in the tournament, uh, which I think will probably fit for the majority of you watching this video, um, let's say like probably 2000, uh, rapid on lead chess probably comes to about 1600 over the board, I would say. So let's just make it average rank up to 2000 to determine what will be like the most effective systems to play. Um, also we're not going to rely purely on the statistics. Of course, we're also going to think about, well, what do we play best as well? Like what openings are we going to feel the most comfortable playing in this case? So for this one, just as the example, I'm going to use the move of uh, D4 as such. Um, just because I recently published, or at least submitted for publishing a course on E4 for white. So I want to cover something a little bit different for this one. But let's say for this, we're going to play the Queen's Gambit for white. Uh, so D5, C4. Uh, against Knight F6, we're also going to play C4 and... You know, we're going to play C4 against almost any reasonable move by black, like E6, C4, you, you know, you kind of get the idea as such. So that's sort of the first step. Step one is to uh, select our openings that we're going to play with white and with black, which we will just get to now. Uh, with black, yeah, obviously you have a, a wide range of options you can go with. For this one, I'm going to go with the Sicilian as such. Um, first, because I still have the most experience playing it, but also it's probably going to be the opening like the most of you either are playing you know, other than E5 or the one maybe that most of you would want to play if you could learn and master like any one opening. So I've decided we'll go for the Sicilian and we're going to make it the 
Sicilian with E6 just because it's the, the best scoring one for black in the in the database. Um, and I will get to what we'll play against the open Sicilian as well, but yeah, we're going to play Sicilian as black and against D4. Um, let's go with the... Let's go with knight f6, c4, and let's say that we are going to play the Benoni with uh, c5 as such. Uh, and then after d5, yeah, and Tanga played a Benko Gambit. So that's going to be sort of our, our two systems in this example, the uh, the Sicilian and the Benko Gambit. So we've kind of decided on what our basic systems are going to be. Uh, now let's go a little bit deeper into them and sort of show a more effective way to prepare the openings for your tournament than what you might be doing currently as such, or what you might be getting from other courses and content. Uh, because most courses and content are going to focus on what are the most common moves at master level. So, for example, if we click on the Masters tab, you can see that, you know, it's going to be Knight F6 and 61% of the games. But the thing is that if you look at the Explorer for games up to the sub-2000 level on Lee Chess, well, you're actually going to be facing D5 and 45% of your games, so it makes a lot more sense to primarily focus on D5 in your preparations rather than Knight F6. Like, the exception would be if you're playing in a round-robin tournament and you, know, you do your preparation and see that most of your opponents are playing, like, Knight F6, then, yeah, it's a different story. But, you know, if you're taking the whole player pool, this very large amount of data, it makes sense you're going to want to primarily focus on the, the pure Queen's Gambit with D5, C4. And once again, you can see a bit of a difference, like in Masters database, you know, the Slav with C6 is the most common. But in Lee Chess, you're actually going to face the Queen's Gambit accepted and the Queen's Gambit declined. More often than you're going to face the move of C6. And also, if you were just relying on the opening Explorer Masters, like say if you're using the Master Games in the Chess.com Explorer, which is going to be pretty similar games to the Lee Chess one. Well, then you might not spend any time looking at the move knight f6, but, you know, it's actually a move you'll see nearly as often as the other moves, and maybe even more often than some of them if you're playing, like, below 1200 level. So you definitely want to be ready for all of these moves. And in terms of picking the one you want to play, I would use probably a combination of three main factors here. Um, the most important one would be what's the move you kind of feel the most comfortable playing, like, you know, e4 might score very well for white, but if you want to avoid very sharp direct play, it might not be the, the system you want to go for. Um, the second factor, yeah, is going to be the score, you know, which line is going to be the most effective against our opponents. Because maybe you decide that you like e3 and knight f3 equally in this case, but in that case you might use knight f3 as a tiebreaker saying that, well, this move scores a little better, I like him equally, so let's go with the one that our opponents will like less. And the third factor you should consider is, of course, the objective strength of the variations. And an easy way to do that is just to click on this little button here, which will bring up the lead, the stockfish statistics. So you can see for yourself, like, which moves are objectively the best and sort of pick the, you know, a move that you know is going to be good. So in this case, yeah, Knight C3 is a little bit more common in the lead chess database, but we can see that E3 is a little bit better of a move according to the theory. So we can sort of play the main moves for both sides, and when you are looking at these dangerous weapons, you also, something you can look at is not just what the score is, you know, 54% win rate is nice for white, but you can also look at, well, are our opponents actually playing the best moves going to the computer, or are they mostly playing bad moves? And this position is actually a very good example, where you can see that below the 2000 lead chess level, which is below 1600-ish over the board, you can see that very few players are finding the best move of C5 here. In fact, it's only being played in 8% of the games. So it means that from a practical level, if you're preparing this for a tournament, you actually want to be focusing more on moves like Bishop to B4, uh, moves like Bishop B7, you know, these moves that you're actually going to face a lot more often in your games. And yeah, it's very easy to say, well, the engine says it's bad, so I'll just figure it out during the game, which is what most people do. And, you know, if you're a strong enough player if you like understand the positions well enough then yeah you can get away with this but it still it gives you a pretty big advantage to know for example that okay in this position we can play knight c3 and to you know sort of look at the sort of common mistakes people are making like seeing for example that okay they're making this mistake and letting our bishop get to this very nice diagonal we can also see this middle game plan of going and pushing the e-pawn and 
starting attack on their king, you know, with something like this, for example. So you can sort of have these middle game ideas where you really understand very well the positions that you're actually going to get in your games rather than, you know, what the masters are playing or what's going to be the main focus of a, a course or book that you know, is maybe written more for the reviewers than is actually for you as, let's say, a 1,200 player or a 1,500 player as such. Um, that's one thing I do differently in my chessboard courses. Like, if I was covering this in the chessboard course for plays below 1,600, I would actually mostly focus on these moves I showed that are more commonly chess database. And I'd still cover the move C5, of course, because it's the best move, and, you know, you should definitely be intellectually honest, you know, covering what the best moves are for the opponent as well. But it just wouldn't be the primary focus. It would be one of the, the sidelines as such, based on what you'll actually get. Um, and of course, when you're going down the tree, you know, you can also look at, you know, what are they playing in terms of like different alternatives to, you know, to the move. Um, now this can take a long time if you go down all the variations, but there are some you can sort of apply a bit of common sense. Like, for example, if they let you take the pawn back, you can kind of figure out the, you know, the details from there in a lot of cases, you know, using similar ideas to, to elsewhere. And you can maybe focus on moves that are a little bit more annoying, like, for example... You know, what do I do if they just try to hang onto the pawn at all costs in this position? Uh, which, by the way, would actually make a pretty good puzzle to see what you would play in this position if you're white, because it shows how, in some lines that you'll be preparing, you're going to really want to know exactly what move to play. Uh, we like to call this a critical position in chess, where if you don't find exactly the right move, then your life could be a little bit difficult as such. Uh, or for the opponent, if they don't find the exact right move there gonna have a really hard time. Uh, so what would you play here if you were white? Actually, I just realized it's kind of weird to set the puzzle when I have the computer on, but actually this kind of is a, a good teaching point that, yeah, the computer will tell you that it's best to take, take, play knight c3 and sort of play it as a gambit with a pawn less with something like this. The thing is that if you're playing as below 1600, you might be like, well, I'm not so sure about this. You know, I'm sacrificing a pawn and, you know, if they're able to get their piece out in time, you know, maybe their position will just be quite good and they'll be a pawn up. So it's a case where it's also good to be practical sometimes. And, you know, when you realize that B3 actually just wins back the pawn directly without too many complications. So if takes, you can take and, you know, you can see here you are going to get the pawn back with, uh, you know, with interest, you know, what is going to be clearly better with his lead-in development and an extra central pawn here. Uh, but you can see how it's so much more practical just to play B3 and just get the pawn back easily, rather than trying to deeply memorize the engine line where you sack a pawn for, you know, compensation that might not be immediately obvious to the average player. Uh, so that's sort of a case where, yeah, you don't always want to choose the first side of the engine. Sometimes you just want to choose what makes your life easy, especially in these cases where you have more than one good move and, like, the difference between the two moves is, is not that great anyway as such. Uh, so, going back a little bit, you know, obviously you could apply a similar process, like, to other moves that you see as well. Um, for example, also one thing I will mention is some people will find some very cool opening traps when doing this. Uh, like, something I actually discovered yesterday, for instance, is that in this position after d5, the move knight b4 is, yeah, actually the most common move below 2,000. But then you just win a piece with queen a4, and I mean, that's where I really, really see a lot of value in doing this preparation based on the, the most common moves over the board that your opponents are most likely to play, not masters. Because you'll find a lot of these little tricks like this in the process that may allow you to just win very quickly out of the opening while still playing good moves as such. Uh, and definitely the lines which score better statistically, again, kind of lead you towards that direction that they may be more likely to, to be a good trap in that case. Um, going back a little, obviously you do something similar with the other moves like e6. You may decide, for example, just to play the exchange variation and, you know, sort of go for something where you don't have to memorize too much theory, but where you could just play a sort of setup against nearly everything, like, say, bishop d3, c6. Uh, obviously there are a lot of other moves they can play, but, you know, you sort of get the idea that you can kind of play it very much like a system opening. Uh, let's say knight f3. Uh, you can also play knight g2, like both moves are quite good in it. You know, it really depends on whether you want something a bit sharper or, or something a bit more positional. But yeah, you know, you can definitely sort of apply some general opening scheme as such, where you sort of just put the pieces on the same squares and kind of know roughly what your middle game plan is, whether that's, you know, to go for the minority attack here or 
you know, whether you prefer to play more in the center, you know, definitely there's more than one, one good way to play this as such. Um, also, you know, against stuff like the Slav, again, you can also choose to pick a potential shortcut. Like, let's say if an opening has quite a lot of theory, but you don't think you're going to face it very often, you may decide just to play something simple just to reduce your workload. Uh, an example of that would be just to play the exchange variation. You know, you're not having to worry about, you know, what if they, you know, take on C4 and try to hang on to the pawn. You know, you just don't have to worry about this thing that you may not face very often, which is still kind of annoying to deal with. You can just sort of make your life easy, you know, just develop very naturally. And yeah, you might not get the biggest advantage possible in, in playing this way, but you sort of get very clear development. I can play Bishop D3, the Knight will often come out and if their Bishop moves, you'll often go Queen B3 and sort of attack their pawn. And, and you can sort of, yeah, also kind of use the statistics as kind of a guide of what will cause the most problems to the opponent. Uh, like this position is a good example where you can see that most, a lot of your opponents are going to be, you know, playing Queen B6 and you know, it's letting you get this better end game where Black's got the doubled pawns and you know, not a whole lot really to show for it. Um, actually, even I'm learning something here as well because I normally would play Bishop B5 without really thinking about it here, but apparently, you know, plans like F3 and a kingside expansion might be even better. So yeah, I'm learning something as well, actually, while we are, you know, going through this, uh, going through this example as such. But it's sort of the idea, you want to kind of make your life easy and, you know, not necessarily learn tons of theory that you're just not going to get to use much in your games. Um, of course, if you're like 2000 plus, yeah, you're going to want to focus a bit more on the slab probably, but still the shortcut approach, yeah, just a nice way to save some time. And yeah, you do want to make sure you know what you're doing against the sidelines. So, you know, a few details, like for example, knowing that after knight d5, that it's a bit more precise to go knight f3 and then play e4. Uh, rather than playing e4 immediately, which, you know, can get a little bit dicey, like, you know, below 1600 your opponents aren't going to notice, but let's say if your opponent does play e5, like, you know, this position can be a little bit awkward to deal with if you haven't seen something like this before, and yeah, computer still thinks white's much better, but again, it's just about making your life easy, and sometimes, yeah, knowing these little move order tricks, like playing knight f3 and then e4, so they can't, like, spring an e5 gambit on you, you know, those little salties can definitely make your life a lot easier in terms of the, you know, move order tricks, as we like to call them. And yeah, you definitely would want to spend a little bit of time checking other things, but like I said, most time you are going to focus on d5, because, well, if you take e6, for example, like, a lot of the time, you know, they're just going to play d5 anyway, and, and just transpose back into what you looked at, so... That kind of shows the value of sort of playing c4 and move 2 against nearly everything, like just playing the same second move... You know, whether that's c4, whether that's knight f3, whether that's bishop f4. If you play the same thing, it just makes it much harder for you to get move ordered if they play something different. Um, now against knight f6 and c4, yeah, in this case, you know, if they play e6, you know, it's fairly easy to go knight c3. And, you know, if they do play d5, it you know will actually transpose back into the, the queen's gamut declined. So again, shows the value of playing the same thing against nearly everything. And if they played an IMSO, you know, you sort of just pick a system that you like. You know, the one that I normally played as a junior was just going for the Rubenstein, like E3, Bishop F, D3, Knight of Three Castles. Now, the Explorer will probably tell you that there's some better scoring move for White than doing this. But if you kind of play the same way against nearly everything, it just does make your life that that bit easier as such. Um, it's kind of funny, actually, that Knight F3 is the, the best scoring move for White in the, in the database here, so... You know, that's kind of a, a nice coincidence. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you don't know what to do, like, you can't really go too far wrong just developing naturally, getting the king castled early, and you know, that will get you into the game with a safe position. And for stuff like the king's Indian, you know, you definitely have a pretty wide choice of systems you can go for. Uh, once again, you may decide that, you know, you don't want to learn all the deep fury with, you know, knight f3, bishop b2, castles in the classical. That is, let's say something you're not going to get to use that often in the tournament. Like, you might face Kings Indian once if you're lucky in a, a nine-round event, you know, unless you're a lot of the players play Kings Indian in your region. So you might decide just to play some shortcut that scores well. Uh, like, for example, you might decide to play Bishop E2, but, you know, then instead of Knight F3, you might go for the Averbach system with Bishop G5, um, which, by the way, also sets a little trap. Like, E5 is a, a little bit of a blunder here, um... 
I'll let you pause the video if you want to try and figure out why exactly E5 was a blunder, but you know, it does lose material by forces that uh, is a hint I'll give. But say if they play knight d7, you can sort of see how, you know, by sort of playing a very clear strategy, you can sort of make your life a lot easier, where you kind of know, okay, we're going to play f3, we're going to play like h4 and g4, and we're just going to kind of expand on the king side and to build up an attack against the black king, uh, while black really struggles to find any sort of counterplay, so... It's a good example of where the most common variation for black in the database makes his life a bit more difficult. Uh, and you also have h6, you can kind of see some little salties as well, like, for example, that you're going to gain a tempo kicking that pawn with queen d2 later on. And also, you know, you can play g4, and you know, again, you're sort of going for a, a very similar plan in a lot of these positions, so it just really shows the value of sticking to kind of a similar strategy where even if they play a move that's not in the theory or in what you're prepared, then you still have a decent idea of what you're aiming for in the middle game as such. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, I spent a little bit of time going into wide opening repertoire. You know, maybe some would say too much, but for the black opening repertoire, you really are going to do a pretty similar thing. Like, you're going to see what the most common move is against your likely opponents, first of all. Um, for this one, I'm going to go with the Khan Sicilian, just because I have focused on the four knights a bit in some past videos and some past content. But you can see with the Khan Sicilian, like, they're mostly playing knight c3, and you, know, you can just have a very, very good score in the database here where your opponents are, you know, quite likely to struggle against your flexible sub and struggle to come up with a good plan. So, for example, with bishop e3, we can already see how, for example, have these moves like bishop b4 are already very annoying to attack the knight. Or, say, you know, if they do play bishop d3, then, yeah, you can sort of go bishop b4, and you know, if they do defend the the knight, you, you know, you get some very nice initiative with d5, and you already can sort of feel how white is losing the initiative just because of a couple of slightly inaccurate moves that were played. Uh, obviously, in the crosshair, you would look at other moves, like bishop d3 is the best move for white, so you probably will want to have some idea of what you're doing here, but you, know, you do have, have many decent options where... You, know, you can decide to gamble a little bit and you know, play the move that scores best in the database, even though the, the engine isn't so enthusiastic about it. Or you could decide to be more objective and you know, play a move like, uh, for example, d6, that uh, you know, does have a, a bit of a better reputation. And again, you can sort of play this one in a very systematic way as well, where even if they play a move that you didn't expect or that you don't know, you can still play a set system uh, to get a good game, uh, like, for example, f4. Uh, let's say knight d7, and yeah, let's just say both sides develop normally just to kind of get a, a position on the board. Um, you know, again, you can sort of see how, like, knowing an actual system, like an opening development scheme, can really make it much easier for you to keep playing good moves even after the opponent goes out of book. Um, and yeah, in terms of this, like, say, here, you know, moves like c4 and bishop d3, you know, if you're playing at a master level, you'll probably face them more often, and you, know, you can see that the the computer does like white's chances after both of these moves. It is a bit better for white. But still, once again, you could sort of follow a similar philosophy of, you know, playing, you know, a similar kind of sub to what we saw before, like d6, bishop e7, and, you know, going for this sort of thing. And yeah, objectively speaking, it is very good for white in this position. But at the same time, you know, it's playable for black. You know, it's a way to reduce your workload. And you know, we're kind of doing the same thing we did with white, like finding a good system of development to play if they do play some sideline or something that it's not going to play as often in general and sort of, you know, adapting our play from there. And again, of course, you want to be ready for the sidelines. Like you want to, you know, be ready for Bishop C4 and you can sort of see how there are some different ideas where you might choose D5 if you like more direct play. Or you could play a little trick of the move order and play A6 and, you know, go for B5 instead or, you know, if they do stop it with A4, then to go d5 and you know kind of get an improved version of a d5 line so they don't have the the check on b5 anymore there's little tricks like this to just allow you to get a often a better position out of the opening if they don't play it in a in a good way um and yeah stuff like knight c3 c3 obviously you're going to be wanting to be ready for this and you know something to factor in is that you know this is a delayed alipin so if they do play the immediate alipin you may decide to play a system that still involves the move e6 in some way, 
just so you don't have to learn two systems against the immediate Alapin and the delayed Alapin at the same time. So again, keeping in mind of the move orders definitely helps there. Um, and you can see as well, moves like Bishop C4, you're going to face a fair bit at low levels, so you do want to be ready for it. Um, also with Knight C3, yeah, you want to. You're probably going to want to play a system that's somewhat similar to your system against the open Sicilian. Uh, you can't really do it against the C3 systems or Bishop B5 Sicilians, but... Against a lot of the others, you know, you can definitely, like, play, you know, A6, for example, and, you know, definitely play in a somewhat similar spirit. Um, or you could just decide to push in the center. That would definitely be uh, be quite okay as well here. Um, you know, avoiding Bishop B5 does have some, some merit here as black. Um, but anyway, also the other thing I should probably mention is, again, you know, when you are... I know I've said this a lot of times, but it's sort of... It's really one of the key takeaways from this video that you definitely... I want to make sure you're ready for the common sidelines where, yeah, you're probably going to mostly focus on the, you know, the get accepted. You know, also because you are sacrificing a pawn here, so you probably want some idea of what you're doing. Um, you know, I will point out that the line with bishop g7, where you delay bishop a6, is a, a nice little tricky system where you're able to get some quite nice play with, uh, with queen a5 and, you know, sort of set some traps here. Um, this system I've done very, very well with, actually, in my in my own games, actually, online, uh, where I've had very, very good results on chess.com with this. Uh, I even played speed on Lee Chess as well, in fact. But yeah, you can sort of see how, like, White's having some problems getting castled compared to the normal Benko lines with Bishop A6 and, you know, the King kind of castling by hand as such. Um, so you can look for these different weapons. You, know, you may even decide you like the look of the... The engine suggestion of e6, which leads to play maybe more like in the spirit of the Blumenfeld Gambit. Um, if you're wondering what the Blumenfeld Gambit is, by the way, that's a system with e6, c4, c5, and you know, going for b5 here. No one of these systems has scored quite well below 2000, because white does have to figure out a good way to deal with the tension between the pawns, and you, know, you do get a nice center for the pawn with d5, even though the Computers aren't so enthusiastic. You can see that Black's getting pretty good results online. Uh, you know, below 1600. Um, so yeah, definitely show some ways you can, you know, find some different systems. Uh, you know, probably the easiest is just to play C5 anyway. And, you know, potentially move order white. Like if E3, you can potentially throw throws back into a D4, D5 system. But, you know, where white doesn't have such an easy C4 push anymore. Uh, likewise, if they play C3... Here you get a choice in terms of whether you want to play like d5 and you know, potentially cause a few headaches for a London player or a Torre player. So you have an early queen b6, which you can see is scoring very, very well in the database, or you know, even knight h5 if you want to play it a little bit more creatively, let's say. Um, you know, it's one thing you can you know, look down and see like what are the lines that are scoring the best in the database, and you know, if you pick this, you're probably not going to go too far wrong for the most part. Uh, you know, assuming the engine also doesn't mind the moves. Uh, but it shows you, yeah, ways in which you can find, you know, paths to disrupt White's normal play. Like, if they play a system opening, you know, there are these ways where they can't just, like, play, you know, normal developing moves without thinking. You would actually have to think a little bit about, you know, how do I deal with this disruption to our setup. Um, likewise, you know, you can see as well, like, you know, that Knight F3 and Bishop F4, yeah, you're going to face, like, 16% of the time in these games. So, yeah, you might not spend a... A mass amount of time say on the london but it's still something you're probably going to look at a bit because you know, there is a you know a decent chance you might get at least once in the tournament and you know, again you can sort of see how sometimes you can apply the same ideas even against a different move order um there will be some differences to be aware of but you can sort of figure it out by you know, playing around with the moves and you know trying to understand why the computer is playing it a certain way in different positions um and yeah below 2000 you're just not going to face c4 or no, free enough for it to really be worth preparing. Like, if you're getting to, let's say, 2,000 feed A or national rating, then yeah, you might want to think about how your D4 opening fits in with these moves. But below that, it's just not going to be such a big deal uh, in general. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's true. You're probably wanting to be ready for moves like B3, because yeah, it's common enough at low levels, so you're going to want to have some idea of how to play the arising positions. And you, know, you might pick up a lot of somewhat quick wins by knowing how to punish their most common mistakes from here. Um, and also, I think another feature I probably should mention as well, like, let's say, for example, you are not really sure how to play against B3, like, you're seeing that the engine's giving a lot of moves a similar value, and you're not sure which one you should pick. 
Uh, my tip in this case would be to go to the Masters database and try to find like a nice high level game in the database that you can refer to. Uh, for example, you can see that, you know, these two IMs have both played the move G6. Uh, I'll do that more slowly. What you can do is you can actually click on the game here and then you can insert it so that it's added to the, the disc as well. So you can just then play through the game in your own time. Like I was using the the right arrow key. I can sort of see how the the position played out. Uh, and yeah, you can see also some some nice typical tactics here, like this 94, which you might mark with an exclamation mark for emphasis, where we see how, yeah, after 94 and Queen A5, they were able to get the piece back. So you might note that as a typical tactic for this uh, this opening in your in your uh, research and preparation, let's say. Um, and this works for other things as well. Like also, you might notice that, for instance, the same play names are coming up a lot in the database. Like you might see Caruana playing this in a few games. Uh, you just see Ivanchuk playing this in a, a few games. Okay, for one of the games he was white. But yeah, you can sort of see Caruana is kind of the main expert here. So you can sort of keep an eye out for for his games as such. Um, the final trick you can do as well is you can actually do a similar thing. Um, I will just add a game from the Explorer just to, again, kind of show how you can sort of build up your, you know, your opening file by looking at some high-level games. But the final trick you can do, um, I'm going to use the... Which example will I use? I'll use an Ida Free C5 move as the, the example. But nothing you can do is you can also just look at games between the two 500 plus players. So we're looking for people who play this opening a lot online. And then you can scroll down here and see like what are the names that are kind of coming up the most. And we can see that this Jurgen Sanchez 97 player is coming up quite a bit. So what you can actually do is you can then look up this guy's name, uh, Jurgen Sanchez 97, by going to player. And then uh, let's just change this up. Uh, so Jurgen, and also it will yeah bring up the you know the name as well, which is quite nice. So I've set it to black, and you'll see that this guy. Uh, not sure quite what happened there. There we go. But yeah, you can see this guy has a lot of games in the database, and you can see how to play against each of these moves based on a player one of the experts of the opening online, where you've got a lot more data of games here compared to in the Masters database by comparison, where. For example, after d5, you can see that this guy is... I'm guessing he's mostly playing b5, but let's check. So we can see he's mostly playing g6 and playing this kind of old Indian sort of setup with uh, d6. So here you can look into this and, you know, by playing through his games, you'll sort of get a good feel of how to play these positions and, you know, what the, the typical middle game ideas are, like when you should be playing for e6, when you should be playing for b5, this sort of thing. Uh, so, so that's kind of a nice little hack as well that can really help. And I'll offer a final tip as well for the more advanced players. Something you might like to do, let's say, if you play under your own name or, you know, if you, so if people like in the tournament know what your username is, you may like to check like what are your moves that you're actually playing the most online. So people, like what are people going to think that you're going to play if they decide to prepare against you? Um, for that, you just click on player again. Um, it's a little bit laggy, just bear with us for one second. Um, but yeah, once this loads, I'll just click here. Um, so my username on Lee Chess is Craze, as, as you can see from here. And basically what you do is you then click on your username, and this will give you an idea of what sort of people will expect you to play as such. Um, actually, my Lee Chess repertoire is a little bit unique compared to what I played elsewhere, but... You know, if I sort of look at what people will think I will play, well, I played the move G6 more than anything else, I think, almost combined at this point. Yeah, I played in, like, half my game, so... I can sort of expect that my opponents will probably think I will play the modern, you know, probably the Tigers modern with D6, A6, and this kind of thing. So this is probably where my opponents would spend most of their time preparing based on what the the database is showing, like us play a... A couple more moves just to kind of give you an idea, like a lot of A6 and this sort of thing. So if I play this, like I really should know what I'm doing in this system, because my opponent may have, well, you know, turn on the engine and, you know, decide to play one of the top lines against this. Um, it's only the move G4 is probably the move that I found the most annoying of late, even though it says I've scored quite well in the database here. So I might decide to play something different then, and, well, C5, yeah, it's the most common move. They might still prepare for it a little bit. But you can sort of see how, like, there's a lot of branching and, you know, they probably wouldn't expect me to play to move E6, so it's something that, you know, would have that surprise effect and that, 
you know, my opponents, yeah, would not be so ready for, relatively speaking, uh, compared to other lines they might have prepared more deeply, like uh, Knight C6 here, for instance, uh, which I play a lot more often in this starter base. And you can do the same thing you know, for your white ones as well. Like, if I just create a new game and do Crazes White, again, you'll see, like, that I mostly played the move G3 in my games, uh, yeah, in about a bit less than half of them, and then sort of D4 is the, the second most common. But again, you can sort of see how you don't have to necessarily play a completely new move, but you might decide to play it a different way. For example, most of my opponents would expect me to go Knight F3, but, you know, preparing C4 is something where I can still play positions I like and have some experience in, but where my opponents, yeah, are not so likely to, uh, you know, to have prepared for it as such. Um, so in this case, yeah, we can see, for instance, that I haven't played the move Bishop E2 yet in this database, so it would be a, you know, a little bit of a surprise for the uh, the opponents as such. Uh, likewise with E6, and and yeah, you can see in this case, yeah, like, not no games with E3 yet. So you can sort of see, yeah, there are ways which can avoid your opponent's preparation, just by, you know, preparing some slight changes. Like, you don't have to necessarily play a completely different first move, but you could also choose to kind of vary within those those options. Uh, again, we see here C4 being played not as much as Knight F3, so we can sort of see how the repertoire try choice, yeah, leads to positions we still have some experience in, but where we also, yeah, are not going to be prepared for. I will say, like, if you're rated below 2,000 or, let's say, if you're not playing in some, like, one-game-a-day event or some event like the Australian Junior Championships where you know, a lot of the players do have coaches preparing them for them, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Like, I just play what you know best and just sort of take it from there. Because your opponents aren't going to be preparing anyway below 2,000 normally. But yeah, if you're in a situation where you kind of know that some of your opponents will prepare for you, then it's an extra factor like like to keep in mind, like, what games do your opponents have on you already and you might try to prepare some small deviations compared to what you've normally played online in the past. Um, so yeah, that's basically... What I wanted to share in terms of how to prepare your openings for a tournament. I hope that you found it valuable. Um, do let me know in the comments what was the sort of biggest takeaway that you got uh, or the favorite thing for you about this uh, this training video. Uh, let me know in the comments. And yeah, I will see you guys in the next video. Until then, take care.